Hello YouTube, this is DVD Review Studios here, and today I'm going to be doing a collection overview of all of my Disney Pixar Blu-rays and DVDs. Uh, which, as of the time of recording this video, there are currently 20 individual theatrical Pixar films. And so, with the release of Toy Story 4 on the horizon, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to go through the entire film catalogue of Pixar films, show off my collection of editions, and voice a brief opinion on each one, while also simultaneously putting them all in a top 20 formation. And so without further ado, I'm going to go through the entire catalogue of Pixar films in a random order, beginning appropriately with the Toy Story movies, and I will show my personal best and worst films of Pixar. So let's begin with Toy Story. So here's the Toy Story Trilogy Boxer, or the Complete Toy Story Collection, which ironically is no longer the case. Uh, but this is the 1 through to 3 box set containing special editions of both the first and second movies, and the third film, which was around the time this box set was released when the third film came out onto both DVD and Blu-ray. And I picked this up when it first came out, if I'm not mistaken, from HMV. And uh, funnily enough, my review of this box set is one of, or the most, uh, viewed video on the channel, which is absolutely unbelievable. Um, but this box set I have a huge nostalgia for. I love re-watching these movies every now and again. And to be honest, I would throw this entire trilogy out there as possibly one of the best uh, trilogies, or one of the most solid at that, up there with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, the OG Star Wars movies, the recent Planet of the Apes films, etc. Um, just overall a trilogy that you cannot really go wrong with. I don't really have any uh, complaints when it comes to these movies, if any at all. Uh, so I'm going to go through these one by one, beginning of course with the 1995 classic, uh, which paved the way forward for the future of CGI animated movies, with this being the first ever fully CGI'd animated film. And Toy Story is a movie, I think, is a film beloved by people of all ages regardless. Uh, the overall story is very simplistic, but I just love the character relationships that we do grow to appreciate. Um, in particular, Buzz and Woody, which is the sole focus of this first film, uh, where we have a rivalry, a love-hate relationship, so to speak, uh, with a jealousy for being Andy's favourite toy. And so with these toys now personified with real raw emotions and overall very sinister objectives at times, especially if you watch the initial original storyboard relating to Woody as a character. There is some really dark stuff surrounding his character initially, but of course that was worked on and uh, improved impeccably in this groundbreaking film. And I think there are so many memorable sequences to name. Uh, I just love the varied characters. There are so many great background characters in particular that do always catch my eye. Um, especially the robot and the snake, which, funnily enough, I was quite sad that they didn't appear in the later films. Uh, but I am hoping that they may be revealed in a flashback scene in Toy Story 4, since a couple of scenes in Toy Story 4 seem to take place before the third film, uh, since RC was in there, and Bo Peep, etc. So maybe we'll see some of those background toys again, maybe they'll get some more dialogue in there, perhaps. Um, but this first film is groundbreaking. I love the character of Sid, the main antagonist, if you will. And uh, overall, this film is beloved by many, many people and is certainly one of my all-time favourites. It's in my top ten for sure, and uh, I adore this film. So that is the original Toy Story from 95. Following that up is the vastly superior, in my opinion, Toy Story 2. Um, which I would say was my second favourite Pixar film for sure. Um, this expands the main cast. We have characters such as Jesse, Bullseye, and one of my personal favourites, the Prospector or Stinky Pete, who is revealed to kind of sort of be the antagonist um, in this film, at least toy-wise, since there's usually a human antagonist as well with Sid. And now in this film, we have Big Al of Al's Toy Barn, which I think is honestly one of the most hilariously crafted uh, human Pixar characters in terms of the way the character is designed. I mean, he looks absolutely incredible, especially with the chicken outfit on. 
But anyway, I find this film to be incredibly challenging of surpassing the initial expectations set up by the original movie. There are so many great and overall iconic scenes featured throughout this film, and many of them I do find personally nostalgic because this was in fact the first ever Pixar movie I ever watched. I did not start with the first Toy Story movie, jumped right into the second one, and I would definitely rank this as my second favourite Pixar film, simply because of how many iconic scenes have stayed with me throughout my my life, in particular the intro scene uh, with the video game stuff, the incredibly iconic I am your father scene between both Zerg and Buzz Lightyear paying homage to Empire Strikes Back. The very ambitious and convoluted baggage claim scene is overall one of my personal favourites, leading into a very heartwarming ending and uh, expanding the Toy Story cast, which is of course heavily explored in the third film, Toy Story 3, which came out in 2010. Before we heard any kind of rumblings about a fourth Toy Story movie, this was supposed to be it, the conclusion, the farewell, the bookend on the Toy Story legacy. This was supposed to be a farewell to the characters and basically a send off for them as we ourselves who have grown up with these movies move along as well. And uh, obviously that is no longer the case, but this film, for that particular purpose, stood out amongst the others, and for a long time was my personal favourite, but honestly, I think Toy Story 2 has taken that spot, but this comes in in a close second in my opinion. I adore this movie, it definitely is a great film for the passing of the torch style, with Andy moving on to college and then giving all his toys to the young girl Bonnie, and I just hope the fourth film doesn't tarnish that, I hope it creates its own tale and its own right with these characters, since we have grown to love and appreciate these as they themselves have become a huge part of Pixar's iconography, and I definitely cannot wait to see them back in action in the fourth film. But in terms of the third movie, it's overall an incredible story. I love the themes of basically a prison break, from the Sunnyside daycare ran by the tenacious Lotso who is overall one of my favourite Pixar villains, and I wouldn't necessarily call a villain outright, he's a very misunderstood character, um, but his backstory is definitely one of the most depressing in my opinion. Um, but I love all the characters featured throughout this, we have Lotso, Stretch, Chunk, Twitch, the Ken and Barbie story was honestly one of my favourites to be honest, I love that sequence where Ken is tied to, I think it's a ping pong bat or something like that, and um, he's basically having all his clothes ripped to pieces as a threat to make him spill information. I love stuff like that in these kinds of movies, I think it's great how they can try and imply sort of subtle and violent methods into their movies without it obviously overtly being offensive material that would not be suitable for an audience that this is catered towards. Some great stuff throughout these films, and the Toy Story trilogy is a legacy in its own right, and uh, I just cannot wait to see what they do and achieve with the fourth film. So that is my thoughts on the Toy Story trilogy. And to round off the Toy Story segment, we have the Toy Story shorts, Toy Story of Terror, and That Time Forgot. Uh, which, although these two movies do not count towards the top 20 since they are not theatrical films, I thought I would just include them now anyway to stay with the theme. Uh, so Toy Story of Terror was a Halloween-themed short film, and took place in a hotel where the young girl Bonnie took the toys when staying away. I think they were on a road trip, I can't quite remember. Um, but they were staying in a hotel, and one by one the toys went off exploring, and then got kidnapped by the hotel manager's lizard, uh, which the lizard character was absolutely adorable in this short film. And uh, the reason why the lizard kidnapped the toys was so then the hotel manager could pawn them all on eBay for thousands of dollars. I think Woody went for like $2,000 in this short film. Uh, just absolutely crazy. Some great ideas surrounding this film, and it was great to explore the other characters that we didn't necessarily heavily explore in Toy Story 3, uh, with Mr. Pricklepants, voiced by Timothy Dalton, and uh, Trixie, voiced by Kristen Schaal, who does the voices of both Louise Belcher and Mabel out of Gravity Falls. Um, but yeah, this overall was a very interesting short film, and personally my favourite out of the two. And I say that because I found that time forgot to be quite a childish film. It was set around Christmas, if I'm not mistaken, and was basically supposed to show a play date between between Bonnie and one of her friends, and how these toys were basically brought into this other girl's bedroom, and obviously the kid had toys as well, and it was just an interesting way, I suppose, to see other toys. 
that we have not seen before. But other than that, I don't really remember too much about this film. It was very forgettable and just overall not as enjoyable as the other one. But nonetheless, that is That Time Forgot. Moving back now to the theatrical movies, we have Finding Nemo, a favourite from my childhood for sure. Uh, this movie I watched religiously as a child. In fact, this DVD set is uh, very old and decrepit at this point, to be honest, but um, this is in fact a fake bootleg I found out many, many, many years later, having owned this for so long. Uh, the cover is printed on paper, and the disc has a purple hue to the back of it. My dad got me this before the movie had even come out on, I think, DVD and VHS. No idea where he got this from, probably online somewhere. Um, but the fact remains, funnily enough, the film looks really good in terms of the quality. It's got a proper root menu and everything, so I'm genuinely quite surprised about that. Um, the film in itself focuses primarily on a very difficult father and son relationship, as Marlon the Clownfish, having witnessed his wife at the very beginning of the film be brutally killed by a barracuda, and basically all the eggs that they had, all their children, just gone, devoured, only one remained, and that was Nemo, the very tiny, unusual fin, which basically became his little thing. And so Marlon became very protective over Nemo, since Nemo was kind of weak in some areas. And that was, in a sense, Marlon's weakness, which is very heavily explored when Nemo inevitably goes against Marlon's wishes disobeys him and then gets kidnapped by humans and so Marlon and the delightful Dory with her forgetful memory voiced by the amazing Ellen DeGeneres travel all the way across the ocean to find Nemo and the film definitely has some incredible animation for the underwater effects especially I absolutely adore just watching the background sometimes of this movie and of course finding Dory um, both films but particularly this one have some incredible character designs. I love Bruce and uh, the other two sharks. I think one of them is called Hammerhead, if I'm not mistaken. Or, no, it was Anchor and Chum. You can tell I haven't watched this movie in a while, but this film overall was definitely one of my favourites from back in the day. Um, Crush was a great character, the Turtles, and uh, Nigel the Pelican, and the whole tank gang, especially Gil, voiced by the amazing Willem Dafoe. So many great moments throughout this movie, and uh, so many great memories from my childhood. So that is Finding Nemo, overall a very exhilarating movie. And then, in the canon of the Finding Nemo world, we have, one year later in their timeline, Finding Dory, which was a surprising sequel to say the least. A lot of people count this particular film, the sequel to Cars, I think it was Cars 3 if I'm not mistaken, uh, and the Monsters University prequel. Movies like that felt very forced in terms of creating sequels to already successful either franchises or brands or individual films. And I completely disagree when it comes to Finding Dory. I find this movie to be very expansive on probably the most interesting character in the Finding Nemo world, and that, of course, is Dory herself, uh, since this film basically harks back to her childhood, and, in a sense, we try to find her origin by finding her parents at the very end of the film. And I love the flashbacks throughout this movie. It's a very well-written film, to my surprise, and uh, definitely doesn't tarnish the original film in any way. It only expands on what we have from that first film. And then we have characters such as Hank, which honestly steal the show, in my opinion personal opinion and uh, the film in itself although forgettable in some areas I think definitely stands on its own two feet and uh, really does emphasize how important characters such as Dory really are in films like Finding Nemo and so spanning her own film in its own right I think this was a very well done sequel and a film that definitely I think deserves a lot more credit than it is given uh, so that is Finding Dory Next up we have Inside Out, which is arguably one of Pixar's most unique and overall groundbreaking original ideas, especially from the past decade. Uh, this film definitely paved the way for new and exciting ideas from Pixar, in my personal opinion, where not only do we now have in Pixar's film catalogue the personifications of fish, monsters, cars, robots, toys, we now have emotions themselves depicted as characters in human form 
form, which overall is fantastic in my personal opinion. It doesn't get any crazier than that, and I think the execution of this concept is pure genius. Uh, another great film entry from director Pete Docter, and uh, the film in itself I think is really well done in terms of having these uh, very interesting characters quite one-dimensional in what they are able to achieve, but then that is expanded upon with what their characters are basically trying to convey through the character of Riley, the young girl which these characters live within, within a sense, since these characters are basically Riley's emotions. And so Riley is the young girl that goes through a very difficult period of time in her life where she is basically taken from her hometown and moved to San Francisco where she has to begin a new school, try and find some kind of inspiration through her hot love for hockey and more or less everything kind of falls apart when both joy and sadness leave the headquarters which takes us on a very interesting journey through the mind of Riley and there we see various memories ideas thoughts and uh, certainly the film in itself is very provocative in what it tries to achieve and it definitely does hit a groundbreaking pace with its characters and overall I think the comedy is very well done as well. I also love the uh, the new shorts that is included on this uh, Blu-ray set. Uh, definitely one I would recommend checking out if you haven't already. Um, so that's my brief thoughts on Inside Out, definitely one of Pixar's best in the past few years. Next up we have another film by Pete Docter, this is The Incredible Adventure Story of Up, uh, which honestly is probably most iconic for leaving viewers distraught within the first 10 minutes, as we see the humble beginnings of Carl Fredrickson, the old man, as a young boy, who meets his sweetheart Ellie, and we see flashes of their life together, only for Ellie to tragically pass away, of course, leaving poor Carl Fredrickson on his own, only for him to get scooped up in the adventure of a lifetime. And I absolutely love his dynamic with the character of Russell, who is just a young boy trying to obtain his Wilderness Explorer badges, only for him to get scooped up in the madness as well. And overall, the film is definitely one of the most unique in terms of storylines. I think it definitely is quite grounded, but does, of course, throw in the absurdist style humor and action, which is definitely some of its strong points. I love the talking dogs. Uh, Doug is quite possibly the most adorable Pixar character, in my opinion. And uh, the villain, Charles Muntz, definitely does give credit to the ideal of you should never meet your heroes because it may not turn out like you want it to do so. And uh, that is basically the case where Carl Fredrickson, who has admired Muntz for basically all of his life in terms of his obsession and admiration for the ideals behind adventuring, uh, it just doesn't work out the way he hopes it to do so, especially with uh, Kevin the Bird involved. Um, this is definitely one of the most evocative Pixar movies for sure. A lot of heart went into this, as you can already tell. And um, this plot is just absolutely superb in my opinion. Easily one of the best Pixar movies out there and it looks stunning on Blu-ray. So here we have the Blu-ray set, same cover as on the slip cover, which is slightly damaged on mine. That's not too much of a big deal. Uh, double disc set is a double play edition. We have the Blu-ray disc and the DVD. And uh, I have no idea whether or not the movie rewards code has been redeemed or not. It's probably expired. I can't see an expiration date on there, but you are welcome to it if that suits your needs. And uh, yeah, that's my brief thoughts on Up. Next up we have Wally, -E, which is directed by Andrew Shanton. This film, overall, I find to be very good. It's definitely uh, only just breaching my top 10 Pixar movies. And that's due to the appreciation I have for the first half of the film, which a lot of people seem to either gloss over or just don't really count as an important part of the film. But I personally love the first half of the movie, which has very little to no dialogue. Um, but it primarily shows a focus on showing without telling in terms of how the animation and overall story is conveying the story going forward towards when we actually get Wally up to space uh, with Eid on board the Axiom spaceship. And uh, the film in itself is overall genius, in my personal opinion, for portraying this decimated wasteland of planet Earth, which is unable to sustain organic life, and how the human beings are basically fled among the stars, leaving 
Poor old Wally, a very lonely robot to basically roam planet Earth, trying to basically succeed with the mission, but obviously with the lack of vegetation and organic life in general, it's kind of a waste of time, and it's just overall very interesting to see Wally as the last remaining sole survivor in terms of these robots, and how that definitely does change for the better when he does come into contact with Eve. So overall, I think Wally is a very memorable movie at that. I love the villainous character of the autopilot, the big wheel on board the spaceship, and there's some very memorable moments slash scenes such as the rogue robot scenario, and uh, the very sadistic ending where Wally is kind of sort of rebuilt, and uh, it's almost as though he's a completely new robot, which is kind of depressing, but obviously if you've seen the movie, you know what happens onwards from there. Um, the box set in particular for this DVD release is very strange. It's not obviously your uh, average or standard DVD by any stretch of the imagination. It's supposed to be sort of environmentally free style packaging, which uh, kind of sort of doesn't work in my opinion. But anyway, we have the sort of cover slightly embossed for the uh, three characters, Mo, uh, Wally and Eve on the front there. And we also have the bonus short, Bernie. Um, who made a minor cameo appearance in the final Wally -E film, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I actually can't quite remember that, but anyway, there's a short film about another character with an E on the end of his name, Bernie, and uh, that was definitely a humorous short that I would recommend. And uh, the short that played before this, I believe, was Presto, um, which is one of my personal favourite Pixar shorts as well. Um, but anyway, we have disc one inside here, which has some nice artwork on there. There's the autopilot wheel and a couple of snapshots from the movie, and disc 2 which has all your bonus features on it, which actually has some nice artwork on there as well. So that is the Wally -E DVD. Next up we have Brave, which delves into some of the least interesting Pixar movies in my personal opinion. Uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with Brave in my honest opinion, uh, I just think the film doesn't really scream Pixar. If anything, this movie could probably pass for a generic Disney classic, and I bring that up in particular because I recently watched the Wreck-It Ralph sequel, Ralph Breaks the Internet, uh, where Ralph and Vanellope journey to the realm of the internet, and while there, Vanellope stumbles across basically all the Disney princesses, and Merida, the princess in this film, is in there, it's just that she's basically played for laughs for not being a Disney classic character. Uh, they throw shade on her for being from another studio, and uh, they play her very strong Scottish accent for laughs as well. They've definitely um, hyperbolized that in the film. But anyway, Brave as a movie just does not bring anything unique or overall organic to the table. There's nothing that flows like most Pixar movies do. It's just overall a very generic story of a princess that does not want to be a princess, does not want anything to do with royalties, but is forced by her mother's hand to partake in the acts and doings of a princess in order to be heir to the queen's throne. And basically she rebels and things go a little bit too far when Merida gets a spell off of a witch to turn her mother into a bear. Um, which, to be honest, is the most memorable moment from this film. Other than that, I genuinely cannot recall too much else. Uh, but it's probably worth a rewatch, to be honest. I did love the soundtrack to this movie. But aside from that, it just does not scream Pixar and is not the Pixar I really remember. When it comes to recalling Pixar, this is probably the last film I will recall when it comes to recognizing Pixar. Uh, so that's my thoughts on Brave, probably in my bottom five, to be perfectly honest. Another film which goes in my bottom five for Pixar is The Good Dinosaur, which, to be honest, is kind of expected. Um, there's nothing, again, really wrong with this movie. Uh, to be honest, the film in itself even struggled to be brought into existence. It began, I believe, around the time Toy Story 3 came out as an idea called Newt, and the idea behind Newt was in fact stolen by another film called Rio by a different animation studio. And basically Pixar just wanted to pull the plug on it because it just didn't seem original anymore. 
um, which is fair game, I suppose, but they kept back some of the ideas, at least I think the characters in the film, and uh, slowly but surely they wanted to restructure and rewrite a new film with what they already had, and from there it just became a total disaster. It felt very forced from what I read online, and basically we got this, which is probably the most sort of pandering and overall one of the most lazy kind of Pixar films out there. Again, there's nothing really wrong with it. I think the characters overall are very cute to find. I love the character of Arlo and his relationship with his human, who is sort of the animalistic style character in this film, Spot. Um, but other than that, what else is there to really recall about this film? Not much. I mean, a lot of it tries to make you care about things, such as when Arlo's father is uh, taken away from Arlo at the very beginning of the movie, trying to teach his son a lesson, and Arlo basically takes that to heart and tries to learn a lesson from that, but just doesn't and continues to struggle throughout the film. Stuff like that feels really forced, because as a spectator we are supposed to care, but we just don't care. At least that's how I found it. Um, the animation, though, I will say is its strongest aspect, especially with Pixar. As the newer films are, the more beautiful they become, and this film is certainly no exception to that rule. Um, the pterodactyls in the movie were probably some of the most interesting characters, the ones that kept repeating the phrase, the storm provides, and they turned out to be quite malicious characters. Stuff like that I think was overall very good and very well represented in this movie, but aside from that, it just doesn't really have much going for it, unfortunately. So, definitely bottom five, unfortunately. Um, just a very lazy Pixar film that was pretty much unnecessary by all means. Next up we have Coco, which is for sure one of the most surprising and overall one of the most unique original ideas from the recent years of Pixar, and this film genuinely did take me by surprise. This is easily uh, top 5 material. In fact, I will rank this at my number 5 spot in my top 20 list. Uh, this film genuinely is one of the most interesting and overall one of the most impactful in terms of its raw emotion. Uh, the character of Miguel, who is an aspiring musician, is in a household where music is forbidden. He cannot play or listen to music, and that's because his mother forbids it due to the fact that her father walked out on their family and he was a musician. And so with that in mind, Miguel actually aspires to be just like his supposed grandfather, Ernesto de la Cruz, and he basically just wants to play music only until he's caught. He accidentally touches Ernesto's guitar, which suddenly transports him into the land of the dead, revolving around the Mexican tradition slash celebration of the Day of the Dead, honoring the deceased. Um, and that's honestly quite a beautiful part brought into this movie, and uh, was overall one of the most interesting. The animation is absolutely gorgeous in the Land of the Dead scenes, and I love, as pictured on the back, the, uh, the leaf litter style bridge across to the Land of the Dead. What an absolutely gorgeous movie with such an impactful, raw emotional message towards the end about family values. And uh, I would also just like to give a brief mention to Dante, Definitely one of the best characters throughout this film. Absolutely hilariously designed. And uh, yeah, overall, definitely one of my new favourite Pixar movies for sure. I genuinely wish I had seen this movie in the cinema. Um, just overall gorgeous visuals and one that I would highly recommend if you have not seen it as of yet. Next up we have The Incredibles, which is for sure a family film with a twist. We have the Parr family of five who all have superpowers but cannot use them to their full effect because superheroes are illegal. And I think that is definitely a great restrictive point on this film because it adds so much more substance to it. For example, obviously with not being able to use these superpowers, this family is basically in hiding amongst society and they just basically try and fit in and live a normal day-to-day -day life. And I think that is definitely a huge strength to this movie which is very much shaken when an old fossil from Mr. Incredible's past, Syndrome as he's called, basically tries to wreak havoc in Mr. Incredible's life. And uh, the film overall definitely portrays an interesting villain through the character of Syndrome, 
who is actually a very competent villain. He is misled in some areas, such as the amazing scene where he believes he has killed Mr. Incredible uh, on the island using the Omnidroid robots. Uh, I definitely think there are some great moments throughout this film which really do explore the psyche of the villain without necessarily portraying a villain that is incompetent or just has a lack of motivation. Syndrome is quite possibly the best villain portrayed throughout all of Pixar and honestly one of my favourite villains of all time. And uh, it's just overall a misguided character that basically just wanted some affection. And that twisted his heart in a way. So definitely an interesting plot development with him in particular. And this film is full of wonderful characters such as Frozone, portrayed by Sam Jackson. And Edna Mode, voiced by Brad Bird himself. Um, the Incredible is definitely a film that I would 100% recommend. Definitely in my top 10 for sure, and overall one of the best movies as far as I'm concerned to do with Pixar's legacy. Uh, so that is The Incredibles. At long last, after a huge demand, nearly 14 years later, we have The Incredibles 2, which is a film that I genuinely really wanted to see happen for the longest time. To be honest, it doesn't necessarily compare to the original movie, but just like I said with Finding Dory, it's very expansive on what we already have in terms of what we already know about this world of superheroes. And with that in mind, we have a whole new array of superheroes introduced into this film. We have a phenomenal character voiced by Bob Odenkirk who tries to re-legalize superheroes, which definitely bounces very nicely off the initial storyline of the first film. And rather than focusing once again on that particular aspect of a restricted family with superpowers, we now have a family that want to liberate themselves and other supers to embrace their superpowers, which is a great twist on the original story and set literally moments after where the first film ends this sequel overall is very strong for its portrayal of the Parr family once again even though it has been a long time since obviously um, these characters have been portrayed on the big screen I think they hold up very well Edna Mode for sure one of the best aspects of this movie the only disappointing thing is the villain side we have a great idea behind the villain of Screenslaver, which unfortunately is very, very underused. And then we also have the Underminer, who is, ironically, undermined. He just does not really appear for more than the few minutes he is in at the beginning of the film. He doesn't really serve a purpose, which is where I would believe an Incredibles 3 would definitely be worth it and just overall give value to that character. And this film, overall, it would definitely make for a great sequel to The Incredibles 2, creating an Incredibles trilogy. Um, but unfortunately, it looks like Pixar is dialing down on the sequels, so an Incredibles 3 is probably very unlikely, especially if you take into consideration how long it took Brad Bird to create this second film. Um, so the sequel in itself, I think, definitely uh, pays huge tribute to the first film. I would regard this as a great love letter to the original movie, and overall, it's just fantastic in terms of its overall substance. So that is The Incredibles 2. Next up we have A Bug's Life, which is for sure one of Pixar's most adventurous movies, especially for their second ever movie just after Toy Story. And so this film I found to be quite ambitious in terms of its animation quality, animating hundreds of ants in very close proximity, and the level of detail in some of the animation sets is genuinely quite remarkable. The film in itself, it was the one Pixar movie that I just had not seen throughout my childhood, and I later bought it towards adult life, and uh, I found it to be okay. There's nothing particularly special about it, it's more or less just a story about standing up for what you believe in, and also standing up to bullies, since the ant colony is more or less the bottom of the hierarchy when it comes to the insect world, where the grasshoppers basically bully and manipulate all the ants to steal food from them. And Flick has other ideas. Flick goes out of his way to basically make sure that the ant colony can sustain itself and survive itself and more or less make sure that the ants will never ever be bullied or bothered by the grasshoppers ever again. And that's more or less what he does by grabbing a bunch of circus insects and more or less scaring off all the grasshoppers. Genuinely, an okay storyline. I thought it was quite creative in terms of the characters and the ambition behind that. 
other than that, it doesn't really do much else for me, to be honest. Um, my favourite scene throughout this film is probably the demise of Hopper, who gets ironically eaten by a bird, and I thought Hopper as a character was a great character voiced, I believe, by Kevin Spacey. To be honest, I always found it to sound a lot like James Woods, and I have no idea why. It just sounds very similar. Um, but that is A Bug's Life. Next up we have Ratatouille, which is Brad Bird's second entry into the Pixar film Legacy. And this is genuinely one of the most atmospheric Pixar films in my personal opinion. I adore the French setting and some of the wonderful skyline scenes, especially when we see Linguini's uh, apartment for the first time. Those are some of the best scenes in my personal opinion and the animation quality is just absolutely gorgeous. The character designs in particular, especially for characters such as Linguini, uh, Coilette, and especially the amazing character of Anton Ego, who is very much underused, his character design in particular. He's kind of depicted to be the main antagonist until that's later revealed to be the chef Skinner. Um, but Anton Ego is probably one of the best Pixar characters ever as far as I'm concerned. I love his design and I believe he was voiced by Peter O'Toole who did a great uh, voice for that character. And the film in itself overall is wonderful for its very heartwarming story of basically a rat trying to find his way in the world and more or less is not supposed to be socialising with humans, in particular that's what his dad tells him not to do, but he does so anyway to explore the realm of cooking. Funnily enough, this is a rat that can cook, and I just love those very bizarre shared moments between him and Linguini when it's slowly building towards the pace of revealing that Remy can in fact cook. What a bizarre film, but certainly one of the most heartwarming. Uh, the character of Coilette, easily one of the best Pixar characters again as far as I'm concerned, to be honest, up there with Anton Ego for sure. And uh, the film in itself is very inspiring in my opinion. And uh, the B-plot where Skinner is basically trying to take the great fortune of the great Gusto for himself, where it's later revealed the funnily enough, Linguini is related to Gusto. Uh, I love that B-plot where he's trying to confide in the lawyer character to make sure that Linguini does not find out about his heritage. And uh, that B-plot is great, especially when Skinner is uh, obsessing over the idea of a rat, or at least the symbolism or the figment of a rat, where he becomes almost paranoid over it. Uh, those are some of the funniest scenes throughout this film. So Ratatouille overall, easily in my top three. I would put this at my number three spot. Absolutely phenomenal movie. I would 100% recommend it if you have never seen Ratatouille before. Next up, we have the Cars movies, beginning, of course, with Cars. I'm just going to outright say this is my least favourite Pixar film. I've never really connected with this movie in any way, shape, or form. I've always found the character of Lightning McQueen to be so generic of just a fast-talking, fast car that basically just relies on his own ego and more or less the fact of him having to be the best at everything, only to be sort of taught a lesson in a sense, only to go back to what he was doing. I've always found this film to be quite a disconnect from the Pixar that I know. To be honest, never found it to be remotely interesting aside from possibly the side characters, which brings us to Cars 2, where the focus shifts from Lightning McQueen to Mate of a Tow Truck. And Mate of a Tow Truck, controversial opinion, but I genuinely find him to be a character that actually has something to him, some sort of substance in his very inept stupidity. Genuinely, I think his character is quite interesting, and that is only brought full circle with the character of Thing Missile, who is in fact a secret agent, which brings a whole bizarre dynamic to the world of Cars, making Cars 2 honestly my favourite of the Cars films. And overall, this one is the most watchable and probably the most rewatchable as well. Um, it's still quite forgettable in some areas, but at least this film actually has something to it in comparison to the first movie, and that's why I would definitely rank this film above Cars 1. And then out of nowhere, we got Cars 3, which is very, very forgettable. 
Um, I would say this was slightly better than the first Cars movie because it actually attempts at redeeming uh, the character of Lightning McQueen because not only was he just a very arrogant, fast-talking, fast-driving car, but now he's suddenly realized that he's one day going to slow down and does. And that hits him pretty hard in this movie where he tries to more or less pass the torch to the car that wanted to drive but couldn't drive in the Grand Prix, and that is Cruz Ramirez, if I'm pronouncing her surname correctly. Um, so I think this film was more or less Cars as Redemption, but still, not a franchise I really connected with, and I just found to be very uninteresting overall. So that's my thoughts on the Cars movies, for sure, bottom five for all three of them. We also have a Cars compilation of short films called Cars Toon Mater's Tall Tales, uh, which has a couple of the Pixar shorts on here, along with some extra ones, which I believe were either exclusive to this DVD or possibly spread out over the course of the three films released onto physical media. Um, but there you go, that's all the car shorts in one available place. Don't really remember any of these, to be honest. Um, but again, it just shows that Meta really is the most interesting character in the Cars franchise. So that is the Meta's Tall Tales compilation. And at my number one spot, we have Monsters, Inc., which is easily the best Pixar film as far as I am concerned. Uh, the way the world building is executed in terms of the monster world and how we as spectators are just engulfed in this idea that every child's closet in the world houses the monster world and how the monsters have to go into the human world in order to gather an energy resource through making a child scream. I love that concept, it's just absolutely phenomenal, it's on another level in comparison to the other Pixar films as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the heartfelt storyline with both Mike Wazowski and Solly meeting Boo and how Boo, in a sense, divides them as characters, and then they're brought back whole once again after being banished, for example. There are so many great iconic scenes that really do speak a thousand words, and in terms of the character designs, I love just looking in the background and seeing all these very unique monsters, but the main characters themselves, such as Sully and Mike, Mr. Waternoose, Randall, even Roz, I absolutely love these characters and how they are formed and how they are portrayed, and there's overall a greatness to the unique character development throughout this film. And that is why, personally, I find this to be overall the most interesting and, for sure, the best Pixar film. I absolutely adore it. Opening this up, this is in fact the Collector's Edition 2-disc DVD set, and so inside we have some unique inside artwork. And then we open this up, we have both Mike Wazowski and Sully on the scare floor. And then we have the two discs with Boo on disc 1 and Sully on disc 2. So that is the Monsters, Inc. DVD. Now, you may be thinking, hey, I didn't talk about Monsters University, and you would be right. I find this film very difficult to talk about in relation to Monsters, Inc., because unfortunately this film really does not house the creativity that I really did appreciate from the original film. There's nothing really wrong with the movie, it's still a very good movie at that, and overall an interesting prequel to talk about when it comes to the Mike and Sully friendship. But aside from that, it doesn't house the creative world-building aspects that I really grew to appreciate from the first movie. And therefore, this film just really seems quite solely focused on just the characters, which is fine, but it removes all the other creative elements. Um, but aside from that, I think the Scare Games contest is overall quite interesting, but once again, with it really lacking a creative outlet in its designs, I think there's definitely something that could have been vastly improved to bring it up to par with the original Monsters, Inc. movie. A simple example of this would be how the campus is designed and looks very sort of normal and inviting and fit for human beings, whereas the monster world that we look at in Monsters, Inc., it's very, very different with certain things obviously basically matching monsters. And so that's where I think this film lacks, whereas Monsters, Inc. prevails and is my personal favourite film from Pixar. And so with the top 20 list finished, I thought I would wrap up this video with a look at the Pixar short film collection Blu-rays. 
Um, so this is both Volume 1 and Volume 2. You can get Volume 3, um, but unfortunately in the UK, for whatever bizarre reason, it has not been released on Blu-ray, just on DVD. Uh, so I have held off on purchasing that one. Um, but here's Volume 1, which has a very nice glossy slipcover. And it gives you a brief list of all the shorts featured on here. We have 13 in total. You can find the majority of these in the bonus features on some of the DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, but on some of mine, they have been missing, or at least um, they've had one and not the other sometimes, which I think is quite annoying. Um, so I just think it's easier to have all of them in one place to binge in one go. And they are very enjoyable, of course, with them being short. They're about five minutes each in length. Uh, but there are some great ones in particular. Knick Knack is one of my favourites. And here is the Short Films Collection Volume 2. No slipcover on this one, but not that that necessarily matters. And uh, here we have some great shorts such as Presto and Bernie. Um, so yeah, great compilations, for sure some of the most creative ideas when it comes to Pixar. And uh, in a sense, these kind of paved the way for films such as Toy Story and uh, as the legacy continues, I suppose. So thanks for watching my Disney Pixar Blu-ray and DVD collection overview. I really hope you've enjoyed. I do apologize for the severe length of this upload. I genuinely did not expect it to top the 40 minute mark. But when it comes to Pixar, there is a lot of range to talk about. And quite clearly, I'm very passionate about Pixar as an animation studio. Uh, so please do drop a comment down below. What is your favourite Pixar movie or do you have a top 5, 10 or even top 20 perhaps? Uh, be sure to leave a like on this video if you did enjoy and please do subscribe for more content coming soon. Thanks for watching.